May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May I thank you for your uh, most extraordinary welcome, a welcome that started a few weeks ago, but which culminates in this uh, amazing service. Thank you to uh, everyone who has played any part in bringing this together. Thank you to the staff of the cathedral here, uh, and to all behind the scenes who have enabled this to be, uh, so far, an amazing day. Um, I want to begin by honouring the diligence and care of those into whose shoes I am gingerly stepping to Bishop Nigel for all that he did and all that he was starting to do and bring to fruition, and particularly for his untiring work in service to the whole county of Suffolk. And then to Bishop David in giving of himself in a, a very uh, unusual and challenging uh, circumstance, giving of himself in faithfulness and attention to the support and sustenance of the clergy and laity in this diocese. I want to um, be slightly cheeky and also honour two of my uh, other predecessors, um, Bishop John Wayne, who today celebrates his birthday. I won't say how many years. <clears throat> Tomorrow in this cathedral, he is going to celebrate his 60th anniversary of being in holy orders and his 40th anniversary in the episcopate. So. John, I look forward to being 101. <laughs> May I also uh, honour uh, Bishop John Dennis, who I discovered celebrated his birthday yesterday. <laughs> and John and I have a particular connection. He also was formerly uh, vicar of the Isle of Dogs, and uh, it was interesting for us to observe that uh, of the four living former vicars of the Isle of Dogs, three of us are diocesan bishops, of which um, the third is Nick Holtam, the Bishop of Salisbury. So who knows what it is about the Isle of Dogs, but we're very glad that it leads here. I feel I've been arriving here for uh, quite a long time, starting with the announcement of my nomination uh, on St. Edmund's Day, uh, here uh, exactly seven months uh, ago. And during these past seven months, I've been uh, elected, my election has been confirmed, I've been consecrated, I've paid homage to Her Majesty the Queen, and now at last, I've been given somewhere to sit. <laughs> I'm particularly thrilled that it was Sheila who sat me there, Sheila, the Archdeacon, is Archdeacon of Canterbury, and it's her role on behalf of the Archbishop to place new diocesan bishops in their cathedra, in their seats. This is the latest momentous action that Sheila has uh, performed in relation to my family. She and her husband, Derek, officiated at my and Yutta's wedding in 1999 having previously supported and advised us as we negotiated the tricky waters of a training incumbent and the new curate falling in love. Sheila and Derek then baptized Anna and Luke, and now this. So for me, with Sheila here, thank you. This is a deeply personal as well as profoundly public occasion. And that led me to think that one of the most precious experiences for uh, any of us is to spend time with good friends. And Yutta and I were able to uh, share with, and you've met some of them and you'll see some of them later in this service, so various friends from overseas whom we had seen uh, with some infrequency over previous years. 
It's in those moments when we taste that particular gift of friendship that we know that that is all possible, that taste of friendship is all possible because of God's gift of friendship to us. And we've probably, many of us, had that deep sense of what it means to reconnect with friends that we've not seen for a long time or lost touch with, and that peculiar ease with which we pick up as if it were only yesterday, even though it might be 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. I tasted some of that last night. And I imagine that each of us can think of those handful of people with whom we can just be ourselves where there is some sort of connecting thread of honesty and trust, all glimpses of God's friendship with us. Which is why I chose for our second lesson that extraordinary scene of Jesus with his disciples the night before his death. Judas has gone, departed in the thickness of night to do what he had to do. And it's now that Jesus says to his disciples, I no longer call you servants, but friends. Here is the group who've been with him for so long now, who've grown in love and trust, bound by Jesus' love and trust of them. It's not all been plain sailing. We know that from the gospel accounts. And they are about to abandon him but he calls them friends now, and they will gather the other side of the crucifixion and be friends again. In this deeply agonizing moment, Jesus is giving them reassurance, even though he knows he's going to die. Here he is the source of their connecting thread of honesty and trust, that unbreakable thread of continuity and connection between them. And I imagine each of us can find ourselves in that room with them and hear Jesus say to us, I no longer call you servant, but friend. It is for me that moment, that scene, a constant focus for the renewal of my faith. And of course Jesus is saying this to them after he's washed their feet serving one another and friendship go hand in hand. And as this great gathering that we are, this great gathering of Christians, this great gathering of representatives of a host of civic and other organizations around this county, we in a way are descendants of that group of disciples hearing Jesus say these words. Each of the congregations and the communities we represent are descendants of this group, called into friendship with one another through Jesus' friendship with us. That does not mean we're best chums or we live in each other's pockets. It does mean that somehow there is a thread of honesty and trust that connects us one to another within and across congregations, within and across communities. And that thread, that unbreakable thread, is the presence of Christ in each of us. This unbreakable thread of the presence of Christ in each of us, that trust and honesty that binds us into friendship, is what enables us to be who God is calling us to be, to be the body of Christ, one member joined to the other, the body of Christ in this place and in all the places from the county and beyond that we've come from. It's the foundation, this unbreakable thread of honesty and trust, the foundation of how as Christians we tackle all the difficulties and differences that beset us, the foundation of friendship flowing from Jesus' friendship with us. We've had within the church 
and we will have huge disagreements, painful, seemingly intractable disagreements. But we find that we are bound together in this divine friendship. What binds us is far greater than anything that divides us. And whether it's the current issues and arguments, or the historic differences that have divided the church, the journey to reconciliation, to healing relationships between and within churches, is the journey of our friendship in Christ. And of course, it is that friendship, the observing of that friendship, that the world, in its brokenness and fragmentation, so longs someone to demonstrate, somewhere to find a place where healing is possible, where relationships work, where trust work, where there's honesty and truthfulness. And of course, there are many ways in which we fail to do that. We betray that trust, and yet we turn again and again, and it's in that turning back to that trust that we witness to that which the world looks for us in. Our connection in Christ's friendship is, of course, what enables us today to gather joyfully on an occasion like this, although let's hope that this is the last occasion like this for some number of years. <laughs> but it's also what enables us to learn from another, one another, linked in trust and honesty. Jesus tells his disciples in this same scene, he says that they are friends to him because he has told them everything. And he's shared with them all that he's heard from the Father. We likewise learn from our own experiences of faith, of practical Christian living, of serving the church, and we share them with one another. As I've gone round visiting clergy in the diocese these last few weeks, I've heard one experience after another of how clergy and congregations have engaged with creatively, imaginatively, the challenges and opportunities that they are facing. How can we share those experiences, good and bad, the ones that work and the ones that don't work, so that we can all learn and grow and do so with honesty and trust. We can, of course, be defensive. We often are. But usually that's because we're afraid that others might be doing things better than we can. I hope we can cast away that particular work of darkness and be willing, even enthusiastic, to learn from one another and build each other up. But this is not what it's all for. This gift of God's friendship shown us in Jesus, yes, is for the church, but it does not stop with the church. And if it does, then it's gone wrong. It is to serve God's friendship with the world, with all creation, realized, made evident in Jesus' self-giving love. Our experience of our friendship with God invites us to widen our circle of friends, to become closer to God's circle of friends. There's one other passage in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where Jesus refers to his friends, besides the passage that Anna read from John 15. And that's in Luke's Gospel, where Jesus describes himself as being seen as a friend of tax collectors and sinners a widening circle. We are called to widen our circle of friends as the church to embrace more and more of that wider circle. People who are different from us, people who are different from, from the way that we see ourselves. We hear in Jesus' calling, his call to us to befriend everyone. Asking, for example, in our congregation from time to time, who is not here? Who is not represented in this community that's gathered to worship God? Which people in our village or town do we have no contact with? These are God's friends, and God wants us to widen our circle 
to include them. I've heard of numerous congregations across the county who are doing this precisely, of course, in love and service, connecting with individuals, with organizations, schools, local government, military centers, and a host of community programs. I've heard of open, vulnerable, risk-taking, loving, generous, passionate people giving themselves in love and friendship to the lonely elderly, the bewildered refugee, the neglected young, the chronic sick, the forgotten poor, and that great swathe of our neighbors for whom faith and God have little or no meaning. And of course, the presence here today of Darlington from Kagira and my friends and colleagues from Germany and the US remind us this circle of friendship is much wider than we often think. God is drawing us further and further beyond ourselves as we let go of ourselves in love and service for others. And the news reminds us of this too, as we lift our prayers to ease the weight of grief and anguish of the congregation in Charleston, as we lift our prayers for those living in fear and suffering from war and conflict, prejudice and ignorance, poverty and hunger. We are all, however small the community is that we live in, however large it is that we live in, we are all connected, joining each other's joys and sorrows through God's network of love and friendship. It is to that that I am committing myself today, to foster and encourage our friendship in God, our friendship with one another, to foster and encourage our friendship with people, agencies, organizations across and beyond our county. Friendship that bears fruit, fruit that is life for all. That can seem daunting, but the first reading, that remarkable reading from Deuteronomy, I chose because it reminds us that this is not all up to us. Friendship, after all, is God's gift. And we're reminded in that passage that Lady Euston read, God's presence is very close all the time. And what God calls us to, or calls us to be, is not, is never too hard. We've been given all we need to live and share in friendship with God, whether we're a congregation of four or 40 or 400, a school, a youth project, a chaplaincy, God has given us what we need to live in God's friendship and share it with other people, all those whom God reveals to us. As we grow in the honesty and trust granted us by God's friendship as we grow in that connecting thread. May the Spirit's gift of open eyes enable, enable us to see the extraordinary opportunities that God is presenting us and challenging us with so that we can live and share God's friendship with everyone.